I'd like to acknowledge that today's Zoom lecture is being broadcast from Ottawa, Canada, where we occupy the unceded lands of the Algonquin Nation. My name is Robert Toombs. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for a very special talk. 2020 is the 75th anniversary of Canadian troops liberating the Netherlands in 1945. In acknowledging Canada's role in today's topic, our intent is not to overstate it, but rather to use it as an opportunity to celebrate the democratic ideal of free speech, which should never be taken for granted. In response to the importance of today's topic, we've been joined by 139 viewers from across Canada, but also from the US, the UK, Ireland, the Netherlands, Norway, France, Italy, Germany, Greece, Brazil, Australia, and the Cook Islands. I'd like to invite Her Excellency Ines Kapusa, Ambassador of the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Canada, to introduce our guest, graphic designer and Dutch national, Henk van Essen. Merci beaucoup, Robert. Je tiens à souligner que la conférence Zoom d'aujourd'hui est diffusée depuis Ottawa, au Canada, où Ottawa occupe ses terres non cédées de la nation algonquine. Mon nom est Joanne Charette, je suis la secrétaire de l'Académie royale des arts du Canada. Je vous remercie de vous joindre à nous cet après-midi pour une conférence très spéciale. L'année 2020 est, est le 75e anniversaire des troupes canadiennes qui ont libéré la Hollande en 1945. En reconnaissant le rôle du Canada dans le sujet d'aujourd'hui, notre, int notre intention n'est pas de l'exagérer, mais plutôt de l'utiliser comme une occasion de célébrer l'idéal démocratique de la liberté d'expression qui ne devrait jamais être pris pour acquis. En reconnaissance de l'importance du sujet d'aujourd'hui, nous avons été rejoints par des téléspectateurs de partout au Canada, mais aussi des États-Unis, du Royaume-Uni, des Pays-Bas, de Norvège, de France, d'Allemagne, de Grèce, du Brésil, d'Australie et de Malaisie. Je voudrais donc inviter Son Excellence Inès Coposi, ambassadrice de l'ambassade du Royaume des Pays-Bas du Canada, à vous présenter notre conférencier invité, graphiste et ressortissant néerlandais Hank Van Essen. Excellence, c'est à vous. Thank you, Robert, et merci à, jo à vous, uh, Joanne. Uh, merci et bonjour à tous. C'est un grand plaisir et honneur de pouvoir présenter mon compatriote de Pays-Bas, Henk van Assen. I'm truly grateful for the opportunity to introduce to you the next presenter in this series of artist speakers, a fellow Dutch national, Mr. Henk van Assen. And I'm happy to do this in the year that the people of the Netherlands celebrate 75 years of freedom a freedom for which many Canadian soldiers sacrificed their lives. The Netherlands will always remain grateful. And of course, we show our gratitude, not with printed art, but with artistically designed tulips, year after year, which you can enjoy in May everywhere in Canada. Freedom is important to the Netherlands. Freedom of thought, of expression, freedom of print, artistic freedom, Amsterdam in the 17th century was a safe haven for many foreigners who in their home countries could not say or think or paint or print what they wanted and they sought refuge in the Netherlands. So printing machines made overtime and an incredible amount of books, pamphlets, poems and plays were published. So that brings me back to Henk van Assen. I must admit, I never realized that when choosing a book to read, my choice is subconsciously affected by the graphic design on the cover, but it does. And not only with books, I think a beautiful graphic design on anything has substantial influence on the choices we make in our daily lives. Hank has made his profession into art, but he took quite an, an adventurous, international and wonderfully indirect path to becoming an award-winning graphic designer. His journey took him from completing his military service, working on a freight barge, sailing between Rotterdam and Basel, to driving a small truck, delivering packages throughout the Netherlands. 
not sure whether this would provide him with a long-term professional fulfillment. He had to rethink his career path. And coming from an artistic family and having been exposed to art throughout his youth, he enrolled to an education of commercial drawing and took lessons in what we now call pre-press. So with that and his love for illustration and drawing, it was only logical to turn to graphic design and he enrolled at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in The Hague. Hank worked several years as a graphic designer, including for a book designer in Amsterdam. And that experience cemented his love for books as well as the design and typographic form, which is needed to visualize content. So he came to the United States to further his studies, which brought him to Yale University. He became a founding principal of HVA Design, a multidisciplinary design studio based in New York City. And in that capacity, Hank has worked on many award-winning projects in print, environmental and screen-based media, ranging from book design to branding and web design. His impressive client list include the Guggenheim Museum in New York City, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, and the New York, New York Public Library, to name just a few. And in addition to his uh, studio practice, Hank is now also a senior critic in graphic uh, design at Yale University and a lecturer at Parsons School for Design. His lecture today brings us back to these harsh years during World War II, more than 75 years ago, before our liberation by the Allied forces. Hank's lecture is uh, titled An Enduring Influence, Dutch graphic design from the 1940s resistance to the 1990s internet. He's going to provide an overview of the role graphic design played supporting resistance efforts during the occupation of the Netherlands in World War II and how subsequent events and key figures helped build the groundwork that would lead to the golden age of Dutch graphic design in the 1980s and 90s. Donc, sans plus tarder, je voudrais vous présenter l'orateur suivant dans les conférences Passage Artist Speaker Series, Mr. Henk van Assen. You have the floor. Great. Thank you so much, Ambassador Kobolsi. And thank you, Bob and um, the RCA ARC for inviting me for this lecture. Um, I'm going to take a moment to share my screen. Everybody can see this? I presume, yes. So, hello, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. Hello, allemaal. Um, je vous présente mes excuses, mais ce matin, je vais parler en anglais. Malheureusement, mon français n'est pas assez fort pour me permettre de présenter en votre langue. Mais je peux toujours parler en néerlandais si vous préférez. Um, so, I have to be honest, when Bob asked me to prepare or think about, you know, a talk that would connect, uh, indeed, the, the liberation of the Netherlands um, by the Canadian troops in 1944 and 45, and somehow connect that to graphic design, in the beginning I was, I was definitely a little bit worried how to make that happen, but as I started to focus on the topic more, I, I did realize that actually there is, things happened, let's say, during the war that really looking back became a platform, in my opinion, on which many designers then moved forward. And as the ambassadors were saying that, in my opinion, resulted in some really great design, particularly the 80s, but of course also began to fly for like um, Dutch design in the 1990s. And I'm gonna to try to cover that in, in four different chapters. Um, I wanna say, generally speaking, I'm not a huge fan of looking back. I much prefer to look forward. And at the university where I teach, for example, at the moment we're having a pretty hefty debate about what to include in terms of content for our students. Um, much of that work has always come from Western Europe and, and from Northern America, of course. And we're really trying to broaden you know, this, this whole range of topics much, much further and wider. Uh, on the other hand, I think we can all agree that we live in unprecedented times as well, and in that respect, it's good to now and then look back, uh, be a little bit sentimental, and for me, you know, particularly this, this era in, in Dutch design really is great. Um, I also want to mention that I'm not uh, a design theoretician, I'm not a design historian, you know, like the ambassador was saying, I'm a working graphic designer, I have a small studio in New York City, um, I do teach, as she mentioned, I've been teaching for well over 25 years now, of which 20 years at Yale University, also at Parsons and at the University of Texas. 
Um, but in general, I'm just a curious human being, and, and I love looking back at graphic design and its history, but, but also the world at large. So I think all of these things kind of brought me uh, now to put, to put this lecture together. Um, and yeah, I, I hope you will enjoy it. So let's start at the beginning, and we're kind of looking at from the 1930s to the 1960s, how kind of the World War, uh, the Second World War, a little bit looking at the resistance, but then also the modernization of the Netherlands. And I actually want to go back even before the war started, very quick look at the 1920s, 30s. Um, I know we have a bit of a, a mixed audience, so some people will be familiar with graphic design, others may not. But in, in the Netherlands, uh, in particular, there was a lot of synergy between the Bauhaus in Germany, Russian constructivism, and lots of travel back and forth between designers and artists. And I would say two of the most well-known designers from that era in Holland were Pete Swart, whom you see some work here. Um, as you can see, also very much interested in Russian constructivism with the photo montage work, and also Paul Schuytema, who was from The Hague. And to me, it's always interesting that, of course, both these uh, designers worked a lot for cultural institutions, but were very happy to kind of bring that design to more commercial endeavors and advertisements as well. And when I think even my own practice nowadays, and we'll get into this more when we move, uh, move on, uh, I think it's quite amazing to kind of see that happy blending, if you will, between the art and culture and, um, and commercial efforts. Another thing to um, keep in mind is like a lot of artists and then also designers, particularly in the applied arts, were um, connected through all kind of you know unions, trade unions, if you will. And probably the most important one was the VANK, the V-A-N-P, which stands for the Netherlands Vereniging van Ambas en Nijverheidskunst. It's okay to forget that. Um, but to, to I'm bringing that up because kind of from the start, from the 20s, 30s onwards. There was a lot of interest in yeah, connecting and, and kind of fortifying all sort of different efforts, not unlike what I presume you were doing in your organization as well. And so um, right before the war, as many of you will know, uh, in 1939, there was a big world fair in New York City. And um, in Holland, that actually became a bit of a problem because the design of the Dutch pavilion, and this was a committee, by the way, within this VANK um, organization. And so the committee for the Dutch pavilion pretty much anonymously had, design, had decided that Mark Stamm, whom you probably know from the cantilever chair, was going to be designing the pavilion. However, uh, through because of political influence, um, in the end that did not happen. And uh, Slot Hauer, who is an, an architect and not necessarily a bad one, but definitely not the preferred option, um, was, was uh, chosen to make the design. So you can see his design here, which is kind of an interesting mix of a little bit of modernist qualities, but of course also has these more traditional overtones of a typical uh, Dutch church steeple. And so needless to say, a lot of artists and designers in this organization were very mad about that. And that brings us to, I would say, arguably the most important person in this whole presentation, which is Willem Zandberg, Zander, as we say in Dutch. And, and we're gonna come back to him uh, and look at some of his own work, but I'm bringing him up now because when, art, you know, when the artists and designers really got mad about the fact that their choice had not been selected, he became the de facto leader of that group and actually led a big artist strike in 1939 to make you know, society at large aware of what had happened. But all of that was somewhat cut short, of course, when in 1940, the German army invaded Holland. Um, and even though the Dutch army put up a fight, after five days, it became clear, actually, particularly after the bombardment, bombardment of Rotterdam, it became clear that the Dutch army was not going to manage. So um, yeah, for then the next five years, for most of Holland, we were occupied by the, German, um, by the Germans. And for artists, that meant that very quickly, they had to decide whether they wanted to join the Kulturkammer, which is basically an institution uh, that followed the Kulturkammer in, in Germany. Um, and it meant that as an artist, whether visual or performing, you had to subscribe to, you know, the ideals of the Nazi party and the German occupier. So luckily, I can say that many, many artists and designers did not want that, which in effect also meant that they, they did not have any work uh, left. So, of course, it became quite problematic to sort of, yeah, have enough economic means to make it through the war. But it's good to see in, in, in retrospect that, you know, many designers and artists did not join. For some of them, what that meant, they actually did go underground and started illegal presses that did all kind of work. Um, and I'm not showing a slide of that here, but for example, some of our most well-known newspapers 
started as little copied leaflets during the war and then became, you know, big, uh, big newspapers after the war. But, um, but, but, but maybe more importantly, in a way, many designers in particular became really involved in like um, falsifying identity cards, food coupon, coupons, what have you. And, and particularly in the first years, huh, when, when also a lot of Jewish people had to go on the ground because the transportation had towards Germany and, abroad, and, and further uh, had begun, like a lot of Jewish people were able to go underground huh, with these falsified papers. Sadly, though, the Germans did realize what was going on and they were able, you know, because of the, the civil registry office in Amsterdam, were able to kind of see these, these fakes. So then the resistance, a resistance group, again, under the leadership of Willem Zandberg, decided that they would bomb that civil registry office. And you see the pictures of that here. Um, and sadly, though, so the bomb attack in itself was a big success. And it's typically argued that that was the, sort of the largest, um, what shall I call it, effort that the resistance put out. But sadly, many artists then were um, captured and, and several were actually shot to death. Uh, Willem Zandberg himself was luckily able to escape and from 43 to 45, he lived on the ground um, in, in hiding in the southern part of Holland. So as the ambassador mentioned, of course, we are all very grateful that in, first in 1944, where the southern part of Holland was freed, and then after the cold, hungry winter war in 45, the Canadian troops were then also able to free the rest of Holland. And needless to say, the Dutch population incredibly happy, even speaking English, to welcome our friends. Um, some people might have celebrated a little bit too enthusiastically. Um, so I was in doing research for the talk, I came across this kind of interesting little pamphlet that was put out by the Dutch government, cautioning for association with soldiers in relationship to STDs. And I'm sad to report the Canadian soldiers are also mentioned here. But let's quickly move on and look at more positive things like, you know, the, Holland, or the Dutch being very grateful, building some monuments and statues. Um, throughout Holland had to, to, yeah, to express the gratitude for the, the liberation. I particularly like this forest that was built in the northern part of Holland. And in doing some research, uh, additional research, my wife actually reminded me that in my little hometown in Holland, which has about 10,000 people, in one of its city walls, and this is really from the 12th century, there is indeed a little clock. And so then I had my mother of 90 years old go out there to take a picture of this. So for all your benefits to see that on April 1745, three soldiers from the Scottish regiment uh, of the Canadian army arrived in Hotham. And on April 18th, Hotham was freed. So I love this idea that it only needed three Canadian soldiers to free my hometown. So on behalf of my family and myself, thank you. Um, as the ambassador mentioned, then of course, the Dutch government at large, very grateful, also royal families. So annually now many tulips are being sent to Canada, which I think is a real nice uh, ritual. And I also came across this little feat, which was quite fascinating. So princess, then at the time, princess Juliana from, went from London to Canada and spent the remaining years of the war there. Her daughter, princess Marguerite, uh, was actually born in an Ottawa hospital. But the, the Canadian government then declared that sort of extraterritorial sovereignty so that she was in effect uh, born on Dutch grounds. Anyway, tiny little details. Um, going back to Willem Sandberg, so after the war, he was appointed the director of the State of the Museum in Amsterdam. And that is arguably, the, you know, to this day, the most important contemporary art museum in Holland. And certainly at the time throughout Europe and, and, and frankly, the, the world at large as well. So it's a really important museum. Interestingly, he was both a director, but he was also the graphic designer, which is, of course, a pretty uncommon combination. And like I said, at the end of the war, he had to go underground. Um, and while, you know, while hiding from the Germans, he couldn't help being a graphic designer, which, by the way, he had done before the war started. And so he started to do a lot of reading and influenced by that reading, he started to make his own books, booklets all made by hand with found paper, wallpapers, you know, construction paper, whatever he could get his hands on. And also, of course, in terms of letterpress, there was not a lot available. So he would try to tear letter forms and, and yeah, really by any means possible, create a graphic design. And so that work really influenced him later on when he worked at both, like I said, as a director, but also the designer. And you can see a lot of his work has, it's very well known because of these torn letter forms. Yeah, but really, in, 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 in addition, like the handwriting, for example, beautiful texted in letter forms, Anyway, I could do a whole lecture on his work, but that you know, would be a different lecture for now. 
Um, one thing that is interesting as well in our conversation, that's just like Alfred Barr at MoMA in New York, he also started to bring in other fields, applied arts. And so not just fine arts in his museum, but also, for example, here is an exhibition around printing and design. Um, Hendrik Nicolas Werkman, which is a pretty well-known printer himself, but then also kind of a designer, poster for photography. So he really brought architecture, applied arts, photography into the mix of things that were shown at the museum. And again, I look at this work now and it's, it's so fresh. It is so, yeah, contemporary in a way. I, I really, it's beautiful. And it's, it still amazes me how that a, a director having to run this important cultural place was able to do all this work. I don't know the, I think he did about 250 catalogs and 270 posters in like the 16 years that he was a director there. He also brought a lot of international artists to the museum. And so needless to say, he brought a lot of, yeah, what shall I call it? A lot of excitement to the, to the visual uh, and cultural world after uh, the Second World War. He received one of his later works uh, for a subway station in Amsterdam. And needless to say, throughout the years, people revisit him often because he is such an important artist. So uh, quite frequently, exhibitions are put up by about, about his work in different places in Holland and, and elsewhere, by the way. I also want to mention, as I you know, said before the war, he was very involved with all kinds of artists, organizations, and unions. And after the war, he was instrumental in starting what is in Dutch called the Gebonden Kunstfederatie, GKF. And that directly, that there's a direct lineage, which I'll spare you all the different organizations that were in between that, but to the BNO, uh, which is kind of the Dutch AIGA, the, the, the Bond van Nederlands Competitors. Oh, now it's, sorry, now it's the Broekstrainer. Anyway, so director of the museum, great graphic designer, and meanwhile being involved with all kinds of organizations, helping artists, helping designers. So a very influential person that I, I cannot emphasize that enough. And luckily his name, you know, lives on in a way because the Sandberg Institute, which is, you know, a very important graphic design postgraduate studies um, program in the Netherlands, um, yeah, carries his name. So in that, that way he is remembered as well. So just um, looking at a few artists or designers rather from that time, Jan Bons, who was a good friend of him, they had met during the war. And as you can see, he follows that kind of visual language of Sandberg quite, uh, quite closely. Um, I love this poster for the State of Museum that Jan Bones did about the Rietveld chair, or rather the Z chair by Rietveld. And then also Dick Alfers was a very important designer. And you can see his work is a little bit more illustrative and, and kind of relates better to like abstract expressionism art, expressionistic art that was uh, prevalent at the time. And so these two artists and others were kind of going in a more illustrative direction as a response to the war. But then there were also designers who really became aware of Swiss modernism. And again, that would be a lecture in its own right. But I think most of us, uh, most of you know that Swiss modernism after the World War became a very important uh, design uh, influence. And in Holland, Otto Treumann is probably uh, the best example of that. And really early on, this is work from the 50s, even let's see, 1948, the late 40s, you can start to see how like grid lines and and sort of a different, more analytic way of organizing started to create, you know, started to help create his designs. Here we see a few posters of that time. Yeah, but you can see that that kind of visual organization, like I said, asymmetry, dynamic composition, really started to play a role in his work. And in that way, he became kind of an example for the next group of designers that, uh, that came after him. Here you see some of his logos. As a matter of fact, he designed the logo for El Al, the Israeli airline. Have yeah, many others as well. And so in general, there was a real sort of movement of industrialization and modernization in Holland. And, and sadly, all of that was accelerated after 1953, because some of you probably know that at that point there was a massive flood in the Netherlands and Zealand, as a matter of fact, the southern the southwestern part of Holland. And as you can see here quite well, how many of the dikes that Holland is known for broke through, the water rushed in, and it was really for Holland, it was particularly so shortly after quickly after the war, it was, it was a great drama, about close to 2,000 people drowned. As a matter of fact, after that, many people of that area moved to Canada um, for better time. But in Holland, it also meant that all of a sudden, like I said, in an accelerated way, many big engineering and design projects were put into place. And the Delta Works um, is probably the most well-known of those, had to really build this whole system of dikes and all these sort of the Delta Islands of uh, the River the Rhine. Yeah, but all kind of waterworks were created to keep the water out so that a disaster of that nature would never happen again. 
In addition, also folders, um, which is a word that you may have heard of, have a basically in, in some of the inner seas in, in Holland, had, they would put a, a ring dike sort of around a body of water, pump out, pump out all the water, and that in turn would you know, become land in which then you know, cities would be built. So here you see Flevoland, um, and it's a bit hard to see, but if you look well, you can kind of see the height difference between the water here and the land about 10 feet below. And so really a big part of Holland is below sea level, but all these big engineering projects were happening in the 50s and 60s. And actually in doing you know, research for, for this lecture, I came across another bit of a footnote in a way, but you know, the Dutch pavilion for the expo in uh, 1967 in Montreal, where on the outside, you know, really contemporary design had been created. But on the inside, though, it was kind of referring back to more old and traditional times, and in particular, sort of paying attention to you know, future tourism. Um, so the second part, uh, I want to look at, for me, three very important designers, Wim Kral, Jan van Toorn, and Gerd Dunbar. And I know that there are some Dutch designers, and maybe others as well, that may not agree with this choice. Can I say it's subjective? But for me, these three names, these three designers are really important. But I do think it, it is really agreed upon in the design world that you know, their, their influence cannot be overstated. So I want to start with Wim Crowell. Um, he was a designer who kind of, as a young person, already became quite well known. And it's, it had a lot to do that he wasn't shy of sort of self-promotion, self, um, I guess. Um, somehow he was well connected with artists and design, other designers, photographers. So he often would appear in you know, magazines at the time really sort of representing what was then considered modern design. And here, for example, a piece of jewelry by Gijs Bakker, a very contemporary jewelry designer in the, in, the, in the 1960s. But again, many people, without even knowing what he was doing, knew of Wim Kral. Um, Work-wise, he started off more in exhibition design. Um, here we see something for the E55 exhibition. So this is the mid-50s. But then at some point, in the, earlier in the 60s, he was asked to do graphic design for the Van Abbe Museum in Eindhoven. And here you can see what became his sort of, um, uh, the, the work that he is known for, which is, you know, not, not unlike a lot of Swiss modernist work, really working with grid systems, working with high contrast alignment, at contrast of small type, big type. But I think what sets Wim Crowell apart is that his letter forms also became really interesting. It became kind of unique. And I think that is what sets him apart from a lot of other Swiss designers at the time. And so as, when you look at this Legere poster, all of this had that asymmetry, that alignment, of course, is common, but then all of a sudden really doing something interesting with Legere, that to me sets him apart. And I think that is what makes him such an amazing designer. Later on, uh, actually interestingly, after Zenberg retired from the State of Museum in Amsterdam, he became the in-house designer. So that meant for the next, I think, 15 years, he did all the work, all the graphic work for the State of Museum. So it's kind of interesting how that continued. Uh, but as you can see, his work is, of course, really quite the opposite of what Sandberg was doing. Uh, but again, still really beautiful. I love this poster about 50, 50 years sitting, which is really about furniture design, sitting, 50 years of sitting. And like I said, his, he was always really interested in kind of new uh, medias, new technologies. So as kind of electronic or electronics and, and of course also rudimentary forms of computers started to enter the design field, he was very much working with letter forms that came directly out of that new visual language that was being created. So that makes him interesting too. And, and all of that resulted at some point in 67 in you know, what's called the new alphabet. And it basically is an alphabet that was designed for the low resolution of computer screens at the time. And by the way, that's not desktop publishing. Those are huge machines uh, in big rooms, so to speak. But the idea that you don't make an alphabet for legibility, but really kind of explore what are the possibilities in terms of technology and what does that mean for communication so all these projects in, in, in many ways were very important they got a lot of attention after he kind of retired from design he became a professor at um, technical university at delft then his fame diminished a little bit but from the 2000 onwards a lot of young designers came back to him he had a big exhibition at the london design museum here you see some of his work he did for the state of museum and like i said very different than zandberg um, but, but still really beautiful in my opinion. So he also though was the co-founder of Total Design, which is a very important design studio in the Netherlands. And this is kind of our madman uh, moment in Holland, I guess. Um, although I do like to think that these guys were a little more friendly than what we saw on TV. 
Um, but yeah, it really was called Total Design because it was the first and for a while only design studio in Holland that would do 2D, 3D, 4D, what have you. They worked together with Friso Kramer, who was a famous industrial and, and furniture designer as well. And so they were able to do graphic design, interior design, and that led, for example, Benno Wissing was one of the other partners that led to like really redoing the whole new Schiphol Airport, uh, which of course many or more and more people visiting from, from other countries that sort of, you know, that airport became really quite known. And as a matter of fact, there's a lineage to many airports actually throughout the world, including here in New York, where if you depart from JFK or Newark, you will see signage that is absolutely the same, the setup the same way as it was done at Skip Hall in the 60s. Um, Total Design then slowly over the next five to 10 years started to do <laughs> really every corporate identity for Dutch organizations. So, you know, all these kind of logos geometrically based, um, that, that became the flavor of the day, so to speak. And of course, at the time that was considered very interesting and modern. Um, ben Bos should also be mentioned, another partner. And so here we see some more work, but I have to say though, and this is now I'm bringing myself in the mix a little bit. It's like, so when I was a teenager, you know, so in the, in the mid seventies, all of the Netherlands was sort of filled with this kind of design and there's nothing wrong with it. It's beautiful, frankly, but there's too much, it was too much of the same. And so at some point, I think there was a little bit of a sense like, okay, there have to be other ways. And uh, just like other places all over the world, had the late 60s, early 70s, a lot of protests against all kinds of institutions. Although I think Holland is probably the only place where there would be a protest demonstration set up by artists because they feel like art is an absolute essential life um, uh, essence. But against that backdrop, my second influence, Jan van Thorn, um, comes into focus. And here's some of his really early work, which reminds you a lot of the work that I showed of Schuytema before the war, had a kind of photo montage. But then quickly on, he was actually asked again by the Van Abel Museum, but there was now a new uh, director, Jean Leering, who was actually an architect. And, and these two together really started to work on like kind of giving a different visual voice to their exhibitions and to the overall culture of that museum. So quite different from what, was, what Crowell was doing at Stedelijk. You know, it's much more about experimentation. It's much more about taking risks. It's also much more about sort of giving transparency to what a museum does. So I do remember uh, this, this poster really was quite known and a bit confrontational really, where rather than showing the beautiful work by Chagall, Duchamp, Kandinsky, what have you, you know, von Thorn showed how much the museum had paid to get these works there. And as a homage to his work in 2013, I have the date wrong here, 2013, they repeated that same system, quite interesting. Um, but the work where John von Thorn himself says that really kind of propelled him forward in this more, but what I would call editorial design. So, you know, designer as author, participating in the process, pushing back against what the clients want, so to speak, um, and for which he's really well known. That happened with the calendars he was doing for the Franz Spruit uh, printing house. And so for many years, he designed these calendars where he would look into political, social, cultural issues, and then through interesting photo collages, kind of work on that. And another poster series that really, you know, at this point, um, as I started to think about my, my career, as the ambassador mentioned, um, and started to think about going back to art school, I saw these posters, which to me were really amazing. There was something about the collage, the colors, um, also the interesting way of managing typography in different ways, the handwriting in the mix, all these contrasts for me felt so different than all the work, like I said, I was seeing from total design and, and, and uh, similar designers that this was really refreshing. And I have to admit, this really propelled me forward to kind of look into art schools further. So all of that resulted into a big debate, which is a little bit exaggerated in my opinion, but at some point, Bim Crowell and Jan Contour had a discussion where each of them defended kind of their outlook in relationship to how they felt how design should be treated. And of course, both working for these museums was a nice starting point, but I'm, I'm gonna not go into that now because we don't have that much time. Um, the third designer I want to mention is Gerd Dunbar, which in, in some ways kind of lives between those two. You know, Dunbar was someone who also liked modernist grids and, and, and you know, kind of a, an analytical organization of sort, but then he always brought in like little playful elements. He called them dingages, which means like little small things. So his work always has a kind of liveliness, a kind of playfulness to it. And again, I remember when studying in The Hague, um, he and also Lex von Peterson, by the way, who was a uh, photographer, Kind of started working on that stage photography that in the early 80s really felt kind of new and there weren't a whole lot of designers that were doing that but they were doing it particularly well 
And so the stage photography became the background, and then on top of that, layers of really interesting typography would happen. But like I said, they brought in fat fun. Here you see Ger Dunbar semi-naked behind a table, and then that sort of, you know, with a fish hat. And that kind of came back in other poses as well. That became more and more sort of professional. Um, and I remember actually visiting this, this, um, this lecture series. But I have to say, living and working in The Hague, I'll talk about that in a moment too, but seeing these posters on the street really was amazing. It felt so new, it felt so fresh, and really absolutely unheard of. And he carried onwards, the world became busier and busier, I have to say, you know, postmodernism, of course, influenced his work as well. Uh, but, but again, there is both kind of structure and expressive, yeah, dynamism, if you will. And I think Dunbar, certainly with his culture work, was an absolute master at that. So here you see some most posters for a dance festival. Anyway, I'm going to come back to him in a different way in the third part of the series of the lecture. And, and yeah, you could argue like, well, okay, he was doing that sort of work for smaller, you know, cultural organizations. But in the mid 80s, he also designed the identity for the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. You know, so he was really good in, you know, convincing important clients to loosen up and to allow him to do have this kind of like, yeah, playful, playful uh, work with their collections. Um, I want to quickly mention he is also um, um, an amazing teacher, worked, taught, sorry, taught at the uh, Royal College of Art in London, but then also made connections with Catherine McCoy at Frambrook and also at RISD with some of the teachers there. And what that meant was like many designers from America, like Alan Horry, Daniel Olson, also Robert Nakata from uh, Canada actually became quite well known because they ended up working at a studio and then stuck around in Holland. So I've, I've been referring to myself here and there, and I want to quickly, um, yeah, on a personal note, so to speak, and the ambassador already mentioned some of that, but yeah, after high school, I was one of these kids that didn't really know what to do with himself. So I ended up working in the, or being in the army, which was mandatory at the time. I worked on a boat for a while. I drove small trucks, sort of FedEx, head through the Netherlands. But all the while I was taking evening classes, correspondence courses, and getting more and more interested in graphic design. And so in 1984, I took the jump and went back to the Kronika Akademie van Beeld and Kunsten, Royal Academy of Fine Arts. And so here are some pictures of the time. And yes, it looks like I'm working very hard on a beautiful painting, but I'm actually throwing darts. So I guess there was leisure time as well. Um, like when I saw this picture again, it blew my mind that we were still allowed to smoke in the classroom. Needless to say, all of this from a very different era. But maybe more importantly, while I was sort of bicycling from my apartment to the school every day, you know, walking and bicycling through the Hague, I would see really quite amazing architecture, particularly our governmental offices and buildings were always done by modern architects. Here we see a moment of like a pretty intricate, uh, intricate sort of corporate design for the ministry. Even social building were really interesting, contemporary, and this is the, the Ministry of the Environment in the background. Uh, Rem Kolhaas had just built his first real building. He had done a lot of speculative work, but you know this was kind of his first actual argument. Uh, sorry, first actual building. But even something mundane like taxes. This was what our tax form looked like: super accessible, super clear. Actually, almost a pleasure to fill in. And meanwhile, while walking the street and seeing posters for all kind of cultural events, this was the kind of landscape that we had as well. Have fantastic posters, somewhat collagey, a little rough, a little expressive, but still accessible, readable, lots of colors. So it was a real pleasure to kind of walk around in the 80s and, and be sort of exposed to all these different levels of design, architecture, and engineering in a way. And um, so at the end of my studies, of course, I had to decide, or sorry, I, I had to do an, uh, an internship and where to go. I wasn't sure. I liked all these things. So what do you do? You go to the two opposites. So I did indeed do an internship at Total Design in Amsterdam, um, where I worked on Ben Boss team for a while, and then also did another one at Hard Worken, which is a, a studio more inspired by Jan van Torn. So I really got these two extremes in a more work, uh, work setting, which was wonderful in retrospect. And I don't want to go into it, but I will say this, again, doing research for this talk, I came about this picture of the Aesthetics computer, like 1988. So this was the computer, the one computer that Total Design had in its offices. And one project I was allowed to do was this sort of certificate. And I remember making little sketch with green pencils to you know, try to create this texture, but then I have to stand like this gentleman here to work with a programmer to make this come out. So I love that, you know, that had to be created with this massive, you know, this massive, massive machine, so to speak. Um, 
quickly moving on, then I worked a couple of years um, as a designer for Reinhard Holman, very uh, good book designer, but then still more interested, ended up moving to the United States where I went to Yale University myself and I worked with Sheila de Bradhill and, and Michael Rock in particular. Um, anyway, I'm not going into that now because that's for a different lecture. So the third part is kind of looking, as I said, while I was advancing through the Hague, like the design for the public sphere, because I have to admit so much of that I took for granted. And like later on, when I started to travel more, I started to realize how special it is to live in a country where design is so omnipresent and everybody expects it. And typically I mean, the cliches when you talk about that are that, okay, well, you know, almost or more than a quarter of the Netherlands is below sea level. So historically the Dutch have always had to fight the water, which creates engineering and design. You have to manage all that. It's also a very densely populated country. Like this is the CIA <laughs> in July, 2020, a couple of months ago, we now have 17 million, 280,397 inhabitants. So a lot of people in a small area, our country is not much bigger than Rhode Island, they have densely populated. So you have to navigate all of that. Design is needed. The Dutch are also not, I mean, they're not happy paying taxes, but if they do pay taxes, they don't mind that a lot of that money does go to cultural institutions. And lastly, we have a long tradition of humanist endeavors. And so this is my simple reproduction of the book. Um, yeah, but there's a lot of publishing and printing that has gone on forever. So all of these things together help add that for centuries now, the Dutch really are appreciative of good design. And again, after moving to America, I realized how special that was because Look at this, for example, these are our uh, logos for our ministries. And so look at justice. It's like very funny lady of justice here. Science, uh, education, culture, letters upside down, integrated. This is for economic affairs. And this is the E and the Z, economische Sachen. On its side comes at you with a lot of movement. Who would do a logo like that for an official ministry? Foreign affairs, interior affairs. What does this mean? The, mind, the Ministry of Finance, lowercase, is this a measuring tool? Is it a cut of F? And, and again, all of this stuff was taken for granted. You know, we were like, no, of course, that's, that's how the whole world behaves. But of course, that was not it. And, and in retrospect, also, it's important to realize that the Dutch society at that point in particular really went through, um, shall I say, uh, went, went through a movement where the notion of authority and, and kind of patriarchal, you know, qualities of the government were really being questioned. And so the, 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 the ministries were also very much interested in having a more client-friendly phase, if you will. I mean, this is also the beginning of the 80s. So it was all about like how these public institutions surely but surely start to move to more, to, sorry, towards a more business-like approach. So I wanna look at a couple of public institutions that really, particularly in terms of graphic design, did amazing work. And so the PTT, which is the post tele, um, well, tele, telephone telegraph really, about basically the postal and telecom service of the Netherlands. In 1984, Gerd Dunbar comes back at this point, he had a studio, Studio Dunbar redid the identity for the postal services. And they came up with this very neat system where red was for post, green was for the telephone and telecom, and then uh, blue was for banking. Yeah, but all these little kind of elements were added. And at the time, this was very new. I know that for many, particularly maybe the younger designers in the group, this doesn't look so, so out there, so to speak. But believe you me, at that time, it was absolutely unheard of. Yeah, but also in industrial design, look at these phone books, really fantastic. And so a whole identity was created. Again, the dingages yeah, are coming back, like little graphic elements. And of course, very much influenced by postmodernism. This was also happening at Cranbrook and at CalArts in California. So I'm not saying that Dunbar was the only one, but again, in Holland, uh, he was really a trailblazer in that respect. And of course, not just in graphics, but like whole buildings. Now this is a little later granted, but, but actually this building I think was done in the nineties. And so really because of the post, many people would go to these offices and would see this good graphic design, this good architecture, good interior design. Like I said, we were, to, you know, we were taking all of this for granted as if it was the most common thing in the world. And I think you're doing something right when your neighboring country, England, actually in its most famous design museum in London, puts up an exhibition about the Netherlands and what the work that was done for the Dutch PTT. So that seemed a good sign. Um, the other person to mention here is Oje Oxenaar. So Oje Oxenaar was um, the director of the DEV, which is the, the Dienst for Aesthetische Vormgeving. And um, he was a director there. And in, the, in that capacity, 
he would commission designers to do stamps, for example, a lot of other work too, but I think stamps are probably the most worthwhile to have a look at. So these are some of the, the postage stamps that he did himself. But for example, he also worked with Wim Crowell, comes back here to work up this beautiful set of uh, number stamps that again, as a young person in Holland, you know, that was, yeah, every letter that you got, you saw one of these stamps on it. Again, using his great Nick font, which by the way, also became his nickname, Wim Crowell's nickname. And, but again, I kind of dipped in my own collection of stamps and look, you know, it's really have been several decades since I looked at it and I'm, I'm looking at this now and I feel both so fresh, so well designed, interesting combinations, word image relationships, interesting typography, uh, interesting compositions. I really do have to say that like a big institutional organization really was ahead of its time compared to many, many other countries. And of course, they'll turn, you know, what I also like about these post-it stamps that they actually became the sheet, sheets, which in itself turned to like beautiful little visual narratives in a way about certain themes in Holland. Yeah, very well designed. So again, Oj Oxenar was, was absolutely instrumental in that because like I said, he managed and then, you know, hired a lot of designers to do that different work. He himself was also uh, hired as a consultant for the Dutch bank. So he did our bank notes. And then later on, he really did some beautiful work for the 50 Gilder note, the 100 Gilder note, and the 251 for me, actually the best one. Um, and, and it's funny because tourists apparently at the time, so we're talking the late 80s again, were really commenting. It felt like the, the money of a play country wasn't really serious enough. But on the other hand, so many protective layers were put in this design that the, it was almost impossible to forge it. So by the time in the early 90s, when you know, the Euro came about, this money was really taken as a standard to look at in terms of like designing new banknotes. And so really, really beautifully done and, and internationally acknowledged. He was also funny because, and I can't really show it here, but in there, for example, as a watermark is his name, OJ, which is quite uncommon in Holland. And there's also his pet rabbit is in here somewhere. So he did a lot of these kind of things. And, and these are books that he designed huh, in, the, in the mid 80s about the work of the PTT. Look at this. Um, yeah, needless to say, I'm a big fan. Quick side note again, another institution that should also be mentioned is the, the Nederlandse Staatsdrukkerij en Uitgeverij. So it's really the Dutch printing house and publishing house. And of course, they did really, you know, well-designed projects for the Dutch government. But Karel Trebus, who was a director there for a long time, um, he put out these books about how to do typography, and typography is a must, and form, form guide, and text guide. So as a young beginning designer, these were the kind of books that I was reading and really learning about how to design, how to do typography, but also about the production of print work and how to think about the editorializing of text. And so really important. And that place was the beginning for many designers. So for example, Irma Bohm, whom I think most of you will know, and absolutely the most famous book designer in the world, I would argue now, she had her start here. And in 1987, 88, she did this books on stamps and was able to like really do amazing stuff and very much out there. Another big organization is the Dutch Railways and uh, back to Gerb Dunbar, of course, um, who then though was still working at Tel Design, which was sort of the Hague version of uh, Total Design. But in 62, he did that firm, but he was um, the leader of that team. And actually, it's amazing how much he reminds me of uh, George W. Bush as a young man. But they designed the logo for the Dutch Railways, which, by the way, he always said was influenced by the Canadian Railway that was developed by Alan Fletcher. And then so the mark was placed on the trains, but quickly thereafter, he came up with this whole idea of color as well. And so he introduced this very bright, warm yellow with the kind of bright blue. And there was a lot of resistance against it. His point was like, that really sets the trains apart huh, from the often gray backgrounds. But train conductors and what have you would refer to it as now I'm driving a banana instead of a train. So a lot of protests, but over the years, it really paid off and people still have, I mean, if any of you has been to the Netherlands recently, you'll see these colors come back all the time. Beautiful signage, symbols. And I remember particularly, you know, when I lived in Holland traveling by train all the time and how easy the map was could be used, the timetables. In terms of infographics, all of this was so thought out, but, but at the same time, so beautifully done. And again, we took all of it for granted. Um, artworks remain an important part for the Dutch railways, have thing, or sorry, modern architecture, but also arts have been placed in the buildings. And if anyone ever feels like too much money is paid for art in relationship to public buildings, I'd like to refer them to the New York Times, where a couple of weeks ago I saw this article 
it's kind of sad really, but about a Dutch train that jumped over a security rail and otherwise would have crashed to the ground. But thank God ended up on this artwork, which is a tail of a whale that then supported it and the conductor was able to safely escape. So that's not an argument, I don't know what would be. So the last big institution I wanna look at is the Dutch police. Um, again, if you've been to the Netherlands, you've probably seen police cars or the fire trucks all kind of working with this color pattern, but it really comes out of this merge in 1980, uh, sorry, 94, of uh, what would, I guess you would call here the state police and the municipal police. And so each of them had kind of heraldic uh, symbols where this was a flame and a grenade, um, this was a law book and a sword. So when Ger Dunbar was interviewed about this, he mentioned that as a studio Dunbar, they made an effort to kind of take that almost militaristic heraldry and turn it into a more civic heraldry. And so at this point, we only have the flame, which can be interpreted in a number of different ways. The law book is still there. And overall, a very straightforward, beautiful typography. But yeah, then these additional lines were added as a graphic pattern. And in many ways, that became the more visible part uh, of the Dutch police. And then at some point, when they also started to do it for the Coast Guard, for the firearms, uh, not firearms, sorry, the, the fire departments, um, it became too much. And there was a, a well-known Dutch designer, Christopher Maas, who really said like, at that point, it started to look like his own country started to feel like Legoland. It seemed like no matter how authoritarian the organization, or, or authoritative rather, the organization, you could put any sort of graphic veneer on it. So he and, and other designers as well were quite, um, you know, quite critical of that. So going to the last chapter here, um, and I call that Dutch design, although in a way I'm really ending kind of at the, at the 1990s, but I do think and for most of you, it is known that Dutch design really took a flight in the 90s and into the 2000s and, and in some ways still does. And so Irma Boom, whom I mentioned, really became an international phenomenon with her book design. Droog design, who did like really interesting work, but, but basically working with banal kind of mundane objects, but putting, putting them together or, or reconnecting uh, them in a way so that they you know, became really interesting projects and, and really because of the design added value um, was created. Marcel Wanders, for example, became really a star in terms of furniture design and interior design. Rem Kolhas, I think most of you are familiar with, which has buildings all over the world. So again, Dutch design took a real flight. And now I know in my, you know, the title of my talks talks about, okay, the resistance, 1940s, still the internet. And when I started off kind of working on this lecture, I did think indeed that, okay, in the early 90s, yeah, with, I know Apple came in a little bit earlier, but I think around the 90s, it really became head of the, the, the desktop publishing um, production mode that many designers started to work with. Of course, it got integrated with, um, you know, with uh, Adobe. Uh, software, and then of course, had the, the World Wide Web truly became the internet where everybody would have access to it. So that combination, uh, particularly of these three things for graphic designers and, and, and you know, many other professions, of course, cannot be ignored. But I have to say, though, that at the end, it's not like because of that, all of a sudden bad design started to happen. Actually, that's nonsense. You know, of course, newer kind of design happens, but I do think how many Many graphic designers in the 2000s up to now do amazing work. It's just using new technologies. And some of my, uh, I'm a real fan of, of, for example, Karl Martens. And you see some of his work. And often, actually, it's still using analog means, uh, digital reproduction. Um, Linda van Deurs and Herman Mavis, also great designers, in my opinion, great book designers. They, they recently, well, a couple of years ago, redid the identity for the State of the Museum. So it's interesting how that keeps coming back. But so I think what in the end became really more of a challenge for design is um, the privatization. So in the early 90s, had based on yeah, a, a big economic crisis throughout the world really, the, the IMF and the World Bank really decided that countries should start to privatize public institutions to be able to get loans and what have you. And Holland, funny enough, obliged faster than any other country. They were, there was so much sort of turnaround from like public institutions that became private almost overnight, yeah, like the late, um, yeah, the late 80s in, you know, throughout the 90s. And for example, the PTT um, became private, the Dutch Railways did, uh, utilities, 
all, all kind of have public organizations kind of lost, yeah, lost the public status. So ironically, here's, you know, a stem designed by Ojo Oxenar, whom I mentioned, but it is to celebrate the fact that then what's called the KPN, how the PTT uh, actually became publicly traded. And I, I would argue that because of that, because of the, yeah, the, the merges that were happening, like graphic design kind of lost its place at the table. Before then, designers had really been able to work directly with clients of important organizations, but also governmental organizations. Again, like I mentioned, governments were really, really interested to have a less authoritative voice. And so they worked directly with designers to make all of that happen. But afterwards, that was less so. Many more layers in terms of marketing, public relations were placed between, the, let's say, the clients, the decision makers, and the designers. So what that meant was that, you know, less and less interesting dynamics, sometimes confrontational works. You guys didn't think I was going to do a Dutch lecture without some autumn bait in the mix, right? So that kind of work started to disappear um, and just wasn't as prevalent anymore. Of course, still amazing design is done in the Netherlands, certainly by individual designers, but on the more public, in the more public arena, we see less and less of that. Um, and yeah, that is a shame. Uh, and, and I have to say, it's kind of interesting, and this will be my last slide. So in 2007, the Dutch government commissioned Studio Dunbar. <laughs> they probably win the prize for being mentioned the most. Um, but I have to say, without Gerd Dunbar in the mix, they were commissioned to design the new identity for the Dutch government. And when I, when, I look, when I look at this logo here, and there's nothing wrong with it. And actually I looked on the website to find out the reasons why it was done and it makes sense. It's all because of efficiency and what have you. But when I think back of the logos that I showed you earlier on of the eighties, where all these different ministries had interesting little visualization of what they did. All of that has now come back to this one simple authoritative logo. And I have to say that, you know, this to me is such, even though it's beautifully designed, no, problem with that. It, it, to me, it is a sort of traditional symbol for symbol and for power and power structures. And it is, it is, yeah, it is interesting that to me, in some ways, we're, in, in Dutch you say, it was, we're kind of back to the start. And I think it is dangerous because, you know, when I think how many people in this world are really sort of intrigued, if not persuaded by this kind of symbology, um, and I only have to look at, you know, the country, my adapted home country now just south of the Canadian border. It, it is, it is, a, it makes me a little scared to kind of see these symbols come back in, in this particular way. So with that in mind, I really miss the Dutch 80s and with its revolution of structured, designed anarchy. I thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Hartelijk dank. Hank, can you hear me? Yes, Bob, I can. Okay, that, that was great. Um, uh, elegant and uh, in presentation and in concept. Um, uh, it's interesting. I don't know if we're going to be having time for for uh, for any uh, any uh, questions. But did you did you have any uh, did you have your chat function operating while you were presenting? Because I don't. The chat is on. I, I think you guys probably want to keep moving, but if anyone has a question, I can get that later from the chat. Um, and if possible, I can answer that later on. I'm, I'm I have one in the, one in the Q and A here. I'll just read it out. Uh, Udo Schliemann, uh, uh, who's of uh, your 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 colleague from neighboring Germany, uh, writes: The Dutch government used to foster design by employing designers for public work, as you mentioned, which let led to great work, is that still the case nowadays? Well, you alluded to that. So, so I'm sorry, the question is whether the Dutch government still hires designers? For, for public work, yeah, for their, for, you, you kind of ended up on that topic. Yeah, yeah, I was, of course they still do, but like again, Studio Dunbar in 2007, like created this more, yeah, total identity, if you will, where every different ministry has now been represented by had a particular cause of arms. Um, so yeah, a lot of the more, in, in my opinion, interesting visualizations of what a ministry does has disappeared, had to be replaced with this more, yeah, 
com complete identity, I guess. But but I'm sure for in you know I don't live in the Netherlands right now, so I, I can't speak too specifically about it. But I heard a lot of my colleagues working in Holland. Yeah, they still work for individual projects for different ministries, and they do work. But but actually, it would be interesting to go to the Dumba website and see some of the print work, for example, done for these ministries. And it is so it's it's good. It's actually it's quite perfect. And but all the uniqueness, the dynamic qualities that we had in the 80s, all of that is gone. And, and I'm not here to necessarily judge it. It's not my preference, but like I said, it, I also understand why it is done. Yeah, but as a human being, I'm disappointed. And I, <laughs> I like what was happening right before I left Holland to come here. Well, we can see that you're, you are a structure, structured anarchist. Now, I have several, I have, uh, several more questions to read to you. Uh, Jeanette Caron, uh, from a Canadian based in Milan, says, thank you for your lecture, very interesting. I guess you know that Jan van Torn uh, passed away yesterday. Oh. Your graphic designer that was featured in your talk. So yeah, uh, no, of course. That, that is sad news. That is very sad news. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry to find out in this particular way, but um, but yeah, thank you for thank you for sharing. You know, my, my condolences. Yeah. Uh, Angeli Grant uh, writes, to what extent do you feel the idea of branding has affected the designer's role? Well, I think greatly. Uh, I mean, it's, I, I have to admit, this was such a sort of grand overview, like each of these topics that I touched upon could be a lecture in its own right. But I think on that question, you know, the way branding seems to be infused in everything nowadays since the 90s and into the 2000s, yeah, like I tried to make the point at the end, I, I think design and certainly graphic design has suffered from that a bit because I think branding operates, yeah, in a different way. I think the goals and the, the purposes are, are really different from what we, graphic designers were able to do in the 80s. Um, and, and listen, all of that said, of course, there are for anything that happens in this world, there are great exceptions. There's still amazing work and also branding agencies. I do think as of late, and I talked for the last 10 years, um, branding agencies as well are employing design in many different ways and are doing really interesting things. Um, but yeah, it just becomes more institutional. It becomes more commercial in a way. And I don't know, in retrospect, I guess I would have to say that it was sort of a golden moment where like all these different forces of, of Dutch institutions wanted to be less authoritative, having good, well-educated designers that also had a bit of a, yeah, an anarchistic streak, if you if you will, they were able to convince each other that that was the right kind of work. And so for a few decades, particularly in Holland, that was prevalent. But looking back at it now, I guess it really was a special moment and not as common as I thought it was. Now, I confess, uh, Anjali is my niece in Seattle. Uh, Camille uh, from uh, Malaysia uh, writes, Hi, Hank. At what point does your nationality influence your work? Well, I think, um, I mean, kind of early on, like, like I mentioned a few times as well, right? Like living in Holland, growing up there, seeing those things that definitely influenced my work. And for me personally, it actually became a bit of a duality or like, yeah, what shall I call it? A set of dual forces where I was equally, you know, uh, equally attracted to the structural and analytical design of a place like Total Design. And then, like I said, the posters by Jan van Torn really made me interested more in visual communication at large. And, and I think, you know, honestly, in my own work and also in my teaching, I constantly sort of battle, but in a very happy way, battle with these two structures, right? that there is indeed some sort of structural underpinning. But then on top of that, you try to build, yeah, interesting, dynamic, visually expressive outcomes. I've got time for two more comments here, and then I think we've we've run over a little bit, which uh, which is fine. But uh, we, we we have to have some uh, some structure yeah. here too. <laughs> yes. So we have um, Billy Gruner from Australia, who writes, "Hello from Australia. My Aboriginal friend and I loved your talk, Graham, especially like your sense of irreverence for tradition while participating in a new tradition, a matter he related to." I love to see such a clear visualization of a history that informs the new modern movement. Um, example, EST Foundation in Leiden that we are connected to. What fun, we love you. P.S. Uh, we will paint a bus stop in the Blue Mountains of Australia in your honor. <laughs> Beautiful, I love it. And now I have uh, somebody who goes by the name of Mr. Anonymous Attendee. He said, 
is Hank's structured anarchy symbolized by his earring? <laughs> um, I, I guess that was my small, my small symbol of anarchy. And indeed, it is true. Like in 19, I think it was 1985, together with my roommate, who was also a designer, um, actually someone from Germany who ended up living and working in London. But both he and I decided that we were going to get earrings. And we went to a place and did it. And I've had it ever since. OK. So, yeah. I've, I think we've got to cut it off there. I did have two more questions, um, but um, Udo Schliemann asks about uh, the, the, the designers and artists in the 50s and 80s were driving force in society for innovation, also social innovation. This in my mind has declined. Science and data have become more important. Do you agree? Quick answer. Yes, I totally. <laughs> no, no, I mean, he's absolutely right. And it, I think it ties in with like really the yeah, the com commercialization, the privatization uh, that I was referring to, but I think you're absolutely right. Like, you know, the, the kind of data analytical sources that, that really uh, spoiled some of had the more spontaneous, impulsive design responses that were possible in the 70s and 80s. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And this is the final question from Dorothy Stern, who you, who, who you met in Ottawa. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. Hi, Hank. Thank you very much for this presentation. My mother-in-law was hidden by a Dutch family during the war and survived thanks to the family that hid her and the Dutch underground and undoubtedly false documents. I had never thought of the graphic design of these documents. Thank you for mentioning this. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Um, I'm very happy you, you, uh, you saw that and heard it. So thank you so much. So thanks, Hank, so much. Uh, it was a wonderful talk and I'm glad that we had such wide participation. We ended up having, I think, something like 75 people at the maximum. And thanks also to Ines Kapusa for her uh, lovely introduction and uh, we wish you good cheer. Thank you so much. Bye everybody.